so very much. If you have your Bibles, let us turn to the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter. I'll be reading verses 14 through 21. Reading from the New International Version, starting with the 14th verse. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And the news of him went out through all the surrounding regions. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. 
So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Uh, then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled for your hearing. The word of God for the people of God, as I ask you to join me as my subject is, was God at the inauguration? Was God at the inauguration? Let us pray. Father, we just come now praying that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. All we ask was God at the inauguration. Fact is, presidential inaugural addresses are unpredictable. But this is, this is good. But they will always refer to the Bible in many cases. President Biden did, as he quoted Psalms 35. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. This is the part of the welcome, a long run, running trend toward more religious language in his public life. President Biden has cited Psalms 30 in speeches before, and it seems, and it seems particularly apt in these dark times. President Biden also encouraged his fellow Americans to open our souls instead of hardening our hearts. An allusion to God hardening Pharaoh's heart, beginning in Exodus 7.13. With these references, 27 out of 45 presidents have cited the Bible in their inauguration address, address making it a total of 64 biblical references. The 44 came from the Hebrew Bible, and 20 passages came from the New Testament. And then we find the most famous president biblical references is probably by uh, Abraham Lincoln in his opening in the Gettysburg Address with four score and 70 years ago. It is a nod to Psalms 90 verse 10, description of a man's lifespan of three score, four, and 10. And if by reason of strength, they be four score years. And that was uh, President uh, uh, Lincoln in those very uh, difficult times. The increased tone in religious may reflect a greater comfort with religion in the public square as Americans have become less concerned over the prospect of state established religion and the likes of which the pilgrims and other migrants fled. Additionally, both parties appreciate the biblical political power. And it says that the Republicans tend to quote the Bible because of their constituents tend to be more religious. Religious doesn't necessarily mean righteous. Religious just means repetition. Amen? Democrats, Democrats are, are often use it to 
indicate that they, they aren't as secular as the party's reputation suggests. And then it makes a statement here when it says biblical illusions are not risk-free. When one does cite the Bible, it is best to be genuine about it. Few Americans forget and saw Donald Trump as he, as a, they don't see him as a deeply religious man. A reputation he solidified in 2016 by referring to two Corinthians instead of second Corinthians. And Mr. Biden, despite his frequent biblical references, recently pronounced psalmist as palmist. Uh, it was a gaffe like these that can lead a religious and secular alike to wonder reasonably about political leaders' sincerity. But we also find and we remember that on January 20th, President Biden delivered his inaugural address. And he gave that address before a small crowd of legislatures and invited guests who gathered around the Capitol. And millions of viewers were watching on the television broadcast. Because of that insurrection that had happened, they felt it was unsafe to have all those per persons around Washington, and they couldn't guarantee their safety. So in spite of that, there still were millions watching on a television. In his speech, President Biden cast his vision for the future, gave shape to his first term in office, and set goals that he wants to reach in the next uh, four years. And of course, along uh, side him was the Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, the Vice President extraordinaire, and one to put uh, pride and glow uh, in our hearts, as his theme was a unity. And then we cannot help but to uh, hearken back, uh, back in around 2009 when the first African American president, uh, Barack Obama, was uh, inaugurated there in Washington, D.C. And what made it so special is that he was a person who came prepared for the job. He just wasn't stuck up there just to be uh, a picture or just, a, just an individual just for the color's sake. He came prepared for the job. And it lifted our hearts that he, he could able to deliver his speeches with, with fervor, using the, the proper language, and also every now and then coming down home with a passage or two. And that just showed that he was gifted and he was the man for the job. Of course, you remember, just as I digress for a minute, is that many of the evangelicals and Republicans, they voted for Obama in the primaries because they wanted him to beat Hillary Clinton because they didn't think there was no way a black man was going to beat a white candidate for the office of president. God had another, had another notion for him. Amen? Amen on that. So we find that, as I asked you, was God in the inauguration? I wanted to go back about over 2,000 years ago, years ago. And I wanted to remind folk of another inauguration address about the Savior of Christ Jesus. And this Sunday we read of his inaugural address. He spoke after having read the passage from the prophet Isaiah at the Sabbath worship service in his hometown of Nazareth. Jesus spoke probably to a crowd of about, oh, 100, 100, 150 people. His words cast his vision of what he understood his ministry to be and the goals he proposed to achieve. Uh, today, I will play the role of a commentator, not like the commentators who will nitpick and analyze the president's speech and add a little nausea to it. Instead, we want to uh, highlight a few of Jesus' words. 
Jesus read two passages from the prophet Isaiah. The passage portrays a significantly different picture of a Messiah from what was commonly led at the time of Jesus. It is an alternate understanding of the Messiah that Jesus sees himself fulfilling. And Jesus sees himself fulfilling this vision today. Today is an important word for Luke. It occurs 12 times in Luke and only nine times in the other three Gospels combined. It occurs in such familiar passages as, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Today you will be with me in paradise. And twice in Zacharias' story. Zacharias came down immediately. Zacephus, I'm sorry, came down immediately. I must stay in your house. And today, salvation has come to the house. And in our text today, in our de text today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. For Luke, today is a moment of radical change. Yesterday can look glorious. Tomorrow can look so glamorous. But today is so ordinary. So many of us get into a, a routine, a rut. Today is just another day. Was Jesus just another hometown boy? Were his words just another teacher's words? The great saving event of God comes in common, ordinary ways. Sometimes we may even miss them. Today is an extraordinary day. God is with us today. Those are idealistic and impossible dreams you can say. I would agree with you, but that is why the word today becomes so frightening. Jesus is saying that it, it is impossible, that, it, that, that the impossible is happening today. The good news is you can start now. You can be a part of those miracles today. The bad news is you will never finish if you answer, if you answer the call to start. It is a lifetime commitment. There will be great, wonderful moments along the way. But there, there will always be more than needs to be done. As foretold by the prophet Isaiah, Jesus declared that he would preach the good news. The good news, though, is only good news when it meets the needs of the people. God's story is always related to human needs. For example, if a woman was dying of cancer, the gospel is God's strong word of resurrection. If a person is, is permeated with guilt, the gospel is assurance of forgiveness. If people experience extreme suffering, the gospel is the prayer. God is our refuge and our strength, every present help in time of trouble. For the starving, the gospel may be bread. For the homeless, the gospel may be freedom in a new homeland. For others, the gospel may be freedom from political tyranny. The gospel is always related to human need. It is never truth in the vacuum. As theologically true, a, a theologically true statement which may or may not relate to one's life. The gospel is God's truth. God's message, God's actions, God's words to a particular person, a particular need, to a particular historical situation. As we gather here today, we, we each bring our own needs. We sing songs not to forget our needs, but rather to praise God who can meet our needs. We hear God's words 
and we listen to a sermon, not to, to hear great theological con concepts, but rather to discover how God will meet our needs and to be assured that God will move in our lives. We pray not to sound holy and not to do holy things, but to lay our needs and our requests out before the Lord. We anticipate that God will act and that things will change. The first part deals with messianic deliverance and the alterations of the status quo. God never leaves people where he finds them. A change in conditions always accompanies an encounter with the divine. Radical change is what Jesus proclaims and will perform. Jesus does not merely affirm the condition of his children. He's about to reveal, uh, he's about to reverse the fortunes that the results not just in change of one's environment, but in the person itself. The person has to change. The change is not a concept or an idea. It is a person. The first person singular pronoun is used three times in verse 18. Jesus is the change. Therefore, any definition of release, sight, gospel, or change must be taken from his actions and his words. The poor receive good news, not cash, but in Isaiah, they are afflicted and are oppressed in general, not merely the, the penniless, so much as likewise captives are not convicted criminals, but those unjustly imprisoned. Americans are used to the idea of freedom as license to do as one wishes. Jesus, however, understands freedom differently. It is a release from captivity to death. The will, <clears throat> the will of others and the will of the self. Jesus will preach the freedom of slavery to God, to God's will, and the service to his neighbor. Such a definition of freedom can only be grasped from the way Jesus will fulfill the words of Isaiah's prophecy. For Luke, forgiveness is more than just sin. Sins are forgiven. It includes releasing or freeing people from whatever has captured them or oppressed them. This would seem to include those in prison, those in bondage, those in addiction, those oppressed by abusive situations. How do we, as people who carry on Jesus' ministry in the world, bring release and freedom to the people in such a situation? The results of Jesus, Jesus' words, his proclamation, was that people were amazed and thought well of him. Jesus' words were good news to them when they were only recipients. But then Jesus went on to say that he was the Messiah for everyone, and they became angry that they wanted to kill him. We may be people who experience the truth of Jesus setting us free, and we may be so overwhelmed by God's love and grace that we can't keep the good news to ourselves. We can't hold it inside of us. And I think just for a minute, as I remember last Sunday, as I told you uh, uh, about a speech that Dr. Martin Luther King gave and says, uh, where do we go uh, from here? And you'll remember after Dr. King had spoke, and he said that there will be moments when the buoyancy of hope will be transformed into fatigue and despair. And he said, our dreams will sometimes be shattered, 
and our eternal hope blasted. He said, we may again be tear-drenched eyes, have to stand before the briars of some courageous civil rights worker whose life will be snuffed out by the dastardly acts of bloodthirsty mobs. And he said, difficult and painful as it is, we must walk in on the days ahead with the audacious faith in the future. And as we continue our charted course, we may gain the consolation in the words so normally left by the great black bard who was also a great freedom fighter yesterday. And he talked about James Weldon Johnson. And he talked about the, the last verse and lift every voice and a sing. And he said that out of the gloomy past till now we stand at last where bright gleam for our star is cast. But then he said, let this affirmation bring our ringing cry. He said, let us give the courage we face of uncertainties of the future. He said, if we give our tired feet new strength as we continue forward stride toward the cry of freedom, when our day becomes dreary with low hoovering clouds of despair, and when our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a creative force in the universe working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil, a power that is able to make a way out of no way to transform dark into yesterday's tomorrow. Let us realize the arc of our moral universe is long, but it tends to bend toward justice. Oh, we know what God is talking about because even in our very lives, we can see that after the inauguration, we seen three or four black men in Target store here in LA drugged out by the police because they were being targeted. We still got a long ways to go. We can still see that racism that's in this country right now in America. And Dr. King and, and the great savior Jesus is warning us that even now, even in these times, there's still a struggle. We still see that jealousy and hatred. We see the folk are mad because the football teams are 95% black. Some can't stand it. Or well, we see that they see the basketball players are 98% black. Some can't stand it. They don't like the way we look. They don't like our hair hanging down. They don't like the brothers that have a little gold in their teeth. They just hate all of that because there's a jealousy about a few of our folk making a little and pretty good money. But the truth is, most of us haven't gotten there yet. And they want to see us all in the same situation we always been. They want to see us in crowded houses in the slum. They want to see us unemployment only working when they want us to work. They want to see us back in the good old days and keep America like it used to be. But I'm thankful today that we have a God above that, is, that has spoken to us and said that he's a God of all the people. He's a God of black, white, green, and blue. And he's a God that has come to set the captives free. He's a God that come to let us know that God is still in the healing business. God is still in the touching business. God is still in the taking what's broken and putting it back together again. And Dr. King just picked up the bloodstained banner. He just picked up the pace. And then he said, let us realize that William Cullen Brown was right. He said, truth crushed to earth will rise again. Let us go out realizing that the Bible is right. And we are witnesses that the Bible is right. We are here standing with breath in our body and a song on our, on our mouth. And we can say, be not deceived. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, he shall reap. If you walk around 
picking up the Bible and holding it upside down and talking about glory, hallelujah, God is with me, God's going to make America great. There's one thing you can't do. You can't blaspheme God. You can't say that something is good is bad. God is not going to take it. So we said this is for the hope for the future. And with this faith, we'll be able to sing in some not too distant future with a cosmic past tense. We will overcome. We will overcome deep in my heart. I, oh I, and you at home, we do, we do believe that we will overcome. Thank you, Father, we pray for the inauguration of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, we pray for the inauguration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you, God, we pray that in 2021, we finally got somebody that sees everybody equal in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, maybe somebody heard the word today, got a little stirred up, we pray. And if you want to join the Christian band, write your name on the heavenly scroll. We invite you to come now. Come by the online ap application, come by Calling up, email, texting us. They say, seek the Lord and he will be found. Come now as we sing our song of invitation. As sweet out of gentle Savior, Thank you, praise choir. Thank all of you for making this a glorious day. And that we give God the praise, the honor, and the glory. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. God at the inauguration. Only time will tell, for they said the right words, they sang the right songs, everybody was in unity. But we'll see 
whether or not there'll be equal justice for all. The love of God, which is eternal, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is unearned, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, which is the fulfillment of the promise, rest, rule, abide in you now and forevermore as all God's children sing together. Oh.